Mm. School visits are, are one of the most important things uh, in my life. I do do between 120 and 150 a year um, over the last five years. And uh, to me, I, I think it's important. Look, here's the truth. The truth is, is that I think that a lot of us write for young people. I'm not so certain that a lot of us actually love them, though. Uh, and that's just me being honest. I think for me, um, it's the other way around. I actually happen to really love to be around younger people. I think that um, to me, and for my life, they've been sort of an antidote to hopelessness in a time where we need them more than ever. I don't even think they always know um, how much of a cure they are to um, some of the downtrodden emotional sort of status that so much, so many adults are in, and in my particular country, and all over the world for that matter. And so being around them is, is, is a gift to me. Uh, the other thing, though, is that I think it's important that they see me. It's important that young folks know that they have an opportunity to grow up and be whatever it is that they want. You know, there's been so many times where I've walked into school and some kids are like, I didn't think he was going to look like that. I didn't know he was going to look like that, right? I didn't know he was going to have tattoos. I didn't know he was going to wear sneakers. And, and, you know, all of this, that, and the third, because for them, author means something very specific, right? Author means, or for that matter, adult means something very specific. And I think for me, uh, it's important to walk into a space where you get to upend some of the stereotypes and some of the, the, the stigma that comes along, uh, one, with writing, and two, with being an adult that does so, coming into a school to give some sort of presentation. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You can't be what you can't see. Right. So young people seeing me, knowing that like, oh, this is a guy who comes from a certain environment, who comes from a certain background, who's had his ups and his downs and his struggles, and he's been able to become this person, I also can become this person. I didn't, you know, For Everyone was not written to inspire anyone other than myself, right? For Everyone is a very personal thing that was never supposed to be published. It was, no one was ever supposed to see it or read it or hear it. It was something that I wrote when I was 24 years. First of all, it's 10 years old, so it's even hard for me to read it uh, <laughs> just because I've changed and grown so much. But it was something that I wrote to myself when I was 24 years old um, and quit writing. When I felt like I'd failed, when I felt um, like perhaps this, this life that I'd wanted so desperately for myself was not going to pan out. Uh, and so I started to write this poem, this letter to myself as a way to lick my wounds. Over the course of three or four years though, my life changed. Things started to shift. Uh, opportunities sort of showed themselves again. I, I picked myself up uh, with the help and support of, of friends and family and people who love me and realized that, uh, that, that I hadn't earned the right to quit. I hadn't earned the right to quit just yet and, and started to, to, to push forward. And it was in that pushing forward that I realized that this thing that was supposed to be used as, as, as a letter of pity, self-pity, became um, a letter of self-proclamation. No, I had been published. I had been published. You know, the, one, of the, one of the most fascinating things about my life and my career is that I've been known for five years, but I've been in the publishing industry for 15. Uh, and, and, and it's a testament to how long it takes sometimes to, to scratch and claw your way uh, into visibility. Um, but I was published when, I was signed when I was 21 years old uh, and published when I was 23. Um, and it's, a, it's a book that uh, is no longer in print, unfortunately, which is why I started writing for everyone because I'd failed miserably, I'd flopped. Um, but it was called My Name is Jason Montu. Yeah. I think, I think it's really important for young people to meet adults who are creating um, art and work and music and, and all of the things uh, as a way to encourage and stimulate their creativity, but only the adults that uh, actually know what their responsibilities and roles are when it comes to the lives of young people. If an adult steps into the room, their job isn't to be judgmental. Right? And I think so, so many young people feel judged and ridiculed by adults because so many adults have no idea who young people actually are. When I hear adults speak about young people, it's usually some kind of disparaging statement. And then when I ask those adults when's the last time they spent time around young people, they have no answer. Those of us who know young people know how brilliant they are. The issue is that young people don't often know how brilliant they are. Our jobs, my job specifically, is to let young people know that. I'm not here to teach them anything. I'm not a teacher. I'm not even a parent. My job is to simply be a witness to their lives, right? And to put that back on the page in a way that is authentic and respectful and balanced and whole. 
It's to recognize that they are whole people as they are, not half-formed things. That because they are younger, their lives are still valuable and have value. Their opinions matter, their experiences matter. Um, the things that they know, their expertise within the framework of their lives is an expertise that should be respected by adults because we do not operate within the framework of their lives. We have our own framework and things have changed. It does not mean that I don't have anything to say that could benefit them. It just means that it has to be an exchange of ideas in order for them to, in order for them to trust me enough to hear what I have to say. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm, 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 I'm really happy that, that Ghost in this series, uh, which I believe over here will be called the Run series, is going to be published in the UK with and, and published by Nights Up specifically. Uh, I couldn't be happier. One, because these books were the books that changed my life. Um, these books are the books that sort of uh, fortunately have for a large part of the educational system in America have shifted the curriculum, have shifted sort of the, the, the literary landscape for young people when it comes to uh, educational curriculums. Um, and, and have, uh, luckily for me, and, and, and I really do mean it, it's a gift to me to know that so many young people uh, have been sparked. Their relationship with literacy and with language um, has been catalyzed by these books. And I, I just I feel so grateful. So I'm hoping that the UK gets on board and that, it, and that we, we have the same impact over here. And I'm grateful for Nights Of because I think if, if I have a chance of making a splash over here, it's going to be with them with these books um, because they share my vigor, they share my passion, um, they understand what's at stake. Uh, and and they don't have any, and, and, for, and for good reason and fortunately they don't have any laurels to rest on and so they have to get out here and push this thing as much as I push for it in America and that's a good thing to be hungry um, for young people to see this work and to have this work and so I, it couldn't be a better situation for me. So Ghost is about a young man uh, named Castle Cranshaw um, and he's growing up with his mother and they live uh, in an apartment building um, in sort of this in, in a, a working class environment, and when Ghost is young, around nine years old, uh, his father, in, in a drunken rage, tries to shoot him and his mother, and, and they run from the house and they hide in a, in what we call a corner store. Uh, and it was in this moment that Ghost realizes that he can run really fast, but he has no idea that there are spaces for young people to run for sport uh, until years later when he. Um, stumbles upon a team, which in America we call a track team or a run club uh, in the UK. He stumbles across a, a run club and decides that he's going to go and make his presence felt. Uh, he, can't, he can't understand why anyone would ever have to practice running because he's never had to practice running. It's something he's always known because he unfortunately experienced a moment of trauma in his life. So this is a story about a young man who experiences trauma and figures out through help, through the help of his friend, his new friends, his new family, his new mentor and the coach, how to turn that triumph, I mean, how to turn that trauma into triumph. And, and I think uh, more than anything, it's just about a young man with a whole lot of heart. Ghost, Ghost is based on one of my dear, dear friends uh, whose name is Matthew Carter and uh, whom I love dearly. He's a best friend of mine. I've known him for oh, 25 years and um, he used to live around the corner from me in, in D.C. And this happened to him when he was young. His, his stepfather tried to shoot him and his mother and they ran and they hid in a store. Right? That's a very true thing, right? And, and it was a moment of trauma that interestingly enough propelled him into becoming a person of extraordinary compassion right it's fascinating how these moments can either tip us to the left or to the right and for him the fear that he felt um, the pain and confusion that he felt what he was able to do was to take it in and turn it into empathy uh, to ensure that he would never inflict that fear or that confusion or that pain on any human being in his life. He's the most gentle person I've ever known and the most open person I've ever known and the most loving person I may ever know uh, in life. And I'll, I'll always um, hold him in high regard and look at him, though he's my peer, I'll look at him and I always will look at him as a role model. I, I try to tackle anger because I try to tackle anger in everything I make um, for that very reason. I believe that all over the world, not just in America, but, uh, but in the UK and everywhere else, I honestly believe that we have a really hard time discussing anger honestly. 
for some reason, it's a topic that we always stay away from. We are, we are really afraid to really delve into the pits of anger and what anger actually is. And therefore, we never allow our young people, let alone ourselves as adults, uh, we never allow ourselves to be fully whole, to be fully human. Anger is human. It's a part of the experience, right? It, it literally comes with the package. Um, and if we don't start talking about it, uh, if we don't figure out how to help young people process it, then we can't be mad at them when they're 25 and, and it's coming out of their bodies in ways that we, can't, that, 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 that we don't like or in ways that become criminal or in ways that become violent, right? We can't blame them for not having the tools we never gave them. And so my job is to make sure that I'm showing them uh, angry, right, because anger is real, and then figuring out ways to write stories that also show them processing and coming out on the other end of that anger or using that anger as a catapult um, to, to push them into positivity, right? Anger can be the thing that pushes you to change the world, right? We should all be a little upset right now, but that anger can be used to turn corners, to change lives, right, to shift culture, um, to change curriculum, to change government, to change prejudice, right? We should all be angry. Um, and if we learn to use it, if we teach our young people to use the anger, um, to use it to, 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 to build bridges and not walls, then we can actually sort of better ourselves. So Ghost was nominated as one of America's 100 most loved books of all time. And uh, it was called, actually it's this big thing called The Great American Read uh, in, in America. And it was actually, I'm actually the youngest author on the list. So it's like, you know, Herman Melville and, and Hemingway, right? And then me, right? Which is a little ridiculous, but also, but also um, an incredible honor. Um, and, and because of the popularity of Ghost, it is a part of American school curriculums. I mean, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And, uh, and it's great. And then in terms of whether or not it's being used to talk about anger, I'm not actually sure. I'm sure that there are probably some juvenile detention centers that are using it. I'm sure that there are probably teachers in uh, violence prevention programs who are using it uh, as well. But I, don't, I can't be certain. What, it, what it's actually doing more than anything is it's simply engaging young people, uh, especially those who are a bit more reluctant to read, letting them know that books can actually be really interesting and can feel very real and can get right to the pulse of who they actually are. It, it can talk about their lives as they live them every single day. And that's all I really, really want it goes to be. It's just a story about a kid, you know? It's literally just a story about this kid who, um, who has experienced something and who has learned from it, who has chosen a family uh, and who has learned from them uh, and who understands that in a race of life you are competing against no one but yourself. I think, I think um, in terms of the sort of class race culture conversation about this book and whether or not it sort of connects with uh, working, a working class kid in the projects in America and a working class kid in the council estates in, in the UK, um, despite race and culture, will they connect? And I think the answer is yes. I actually think that there are intersections, right? And I think that I think Ghost is an intersectional book. I think that if you are a black kid of any background, you will connect to this book. If you are a working class and or poor kid of any background, you will connect to this book. It's sort of the intersection between those two things. Um, furthermore, if you are uh, a kid who has ex of, of any background or of any class who has experienced trauma, you will connect to this book. Uh, if you are a kid of any background who's an athlete, you will connect to this book, right? And so basically what it does is it, it, it sort of, it sort of uh, splinters out into several different several different zones and I think it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from there's something here for you right if you've ever been on a team and you have teammates you know what it means to to sort of have that kind of love and support around you you'll connect just in the, in the way they relate to each other on the track if you've ever uh, if you have if you come from a single parent household and, and you're being raised just by your mother you will connect because you understand the kind of sacrifices that it takes for, to be raised by a single parent and, and what parents have to do and how you grow up feeling a kind of responsibility because you're made aware of, of your parent, your mother's or father's responsibility at a young age because you know they're doing it by themselves. You will connect. All of it is sort of in this book, in these few pages, all of those things are sort of touched upon. I think, I think that 
the beauty of literature is just that, right? That, that we can share stories that my story or a single story all around the world can be connected to and can connect all of us, right? I think, I think, I think we really underestimate the power of the human story. Uh, and I think we try our best to try to, you know, people always want to create stories that are vague, right? It's like, I don't want to, I don't want to alienate a specific kind of person. When the truth is, is that specificity is what creates the bond, right? If I can be completely honest about a specific culture, a specific class, if I can be honest about that, then we can insert ourselves into the story. But if it's all bland, uh, then it means nothing to anyone, right? It's, it's a complete wash. There needs to be some, there needs to be some distillation. It needs to sort of narrow down and be a thing as a snapshot of a particular story in order for the rest of the world to inject themselves into it. Prime example, there's a, a book, one of my mentors in America, his name was Walter Dean Myers. He's passed away now. His son is also an author named Christopher Myers, one of my best friends. Uh, and years ago, Chris wrote a book called Black Cat. Publishers didn't want this book to be published as it was because Chris said that the black cat is walking through Harlem, New York. And this is what the black cat is seeing in Harlem, New York. Publishers said it's too specific and so make it neighborhood. Black cat walks through neighborhood. They published the book, it spreads around the world and suddenly Chris starts getting fan mail from all over the place. And that fan mail are, are projects from kids. And it says, this is black cat in Mogadishu. This is Black Cat in Berlin. This is Black Cat in Somalia. Black Cat in Edinburgh. Black Cat in Tokyo, right? And the reason they were able to create Black Cats in their communities is because he had chose to be specific about Black Cat in Harlem. That's the way it works. It's human, right? We invest in each other more than anything else. We are our greatest influences. Um, and, and literature can oftentimes be the platform for that, for that influence to take place. my writing process and the, the way these things sort of feel real. Uh, I used to work in, the, I sold clothes for a very long time. I worked in, I was a shop boy. I worked in a boutique downtown New York for years. And if this didn't happen, I would, I'd be at work right now, actually, because uh, I had, I didn't know what else I would do with my life. And so in the fashion world, when you buy a sweater, right, especially for women's sweaters, they, what they say is it's been knit with a loose hand. So if the sweater has open gauged holes in it, and if it's sort of flowy and you can kind of see through it, if it feels almost like a netting or a meshing, uh, it's, it's, they say it's knit with a loose hand. And if it's tight, if it's a tight knit sweater, like maybe a wool sweater or winter sweater, um, which tend to be a bit more rigid, they say it's, it's knit with a, with a tight hand. Um, I try to write stories that are knit with a loose hand. What does that mean? That means that when I sit down at the page, instead of me thinking about all the rules of writing, instead of me thinking about how sentence structure and where the commas go, uh, what, what's the syntax, what's the best word choice, all these things that we're sort of, um, you know, institutionalized with in our, in our academic, you know, facilities and, you know, schools and this, that, and the third, I throw all that out the window and it's all about gut work. What feels good? I only write what feels good. I, I, my, my first editor when I was 21 said, told me that my intuition would take me farther than my education ever would. And she was the, be was the best gift she could have ever given me. So when I sit at the page, I write what feels good to me. I just let it come out. I fix it later, right? So when Ghost says, I got so much scream in me, right? That's a sentence that I write because it just feels like the right thing to say. It feels like something that this character would say. I've been living with Ghost for years before I ever wrote him. I've been living with these characters in my head. Like, who is he? Right? Let, let me make sure that I know who he is fully. And if I know who he is, I have to honor his voice, right? I don't write characters. I write people. To write a character is to write a caricature of a person, right? I write people, a whole person. In order to do that, I got to be honest about who they are. But first, I got to get to know them. And then I got to relax and let that story be told. Let their voices come through with a loose hand, with a loose hand. All the rigidity is out of here. All the rules are out of here. Uh, you know, I, I just, I think that's, that's sort of the... That's the gift of not knowing so much. Sometimes ignorance can be a gift, right? That's the gift of not knowing all the rules, the gift of not knowing all the classics, the gift of not knowing all these things that we're supposed to know in order to be good writers. It's like, uh, I'm just gonna go with my gut. Oh, I read a lot of books, the children's books, of course. I mean, I read uh, everything, but I, I definitely read a lot of children. There are lots of books that I wish I would have written, let alone books I wish I would have read, you know. I, I'm fortunate to know uh, so many brilliant writers. Um, I mean, 
I mean, I, look, I wish I had Kwame Alexander's crossover when I was a little, when I was a young man. It had been so so helpful for me. You know, Sharon Creech's "Love That Dog," Jackie Woodson's "Anything," right? Jack, anything that Jacqueline Woodson's ever written. I wish I would have had those books when I was younger. Matt De La Pena, "Ball Don't Lie." If I'd have had that book when I was a kid, it would have been incredible. Laurie Hawes Anderson's "Speak." The first time I read it, I, I, it changed, it chemically changed how I felt about the young ladies around me and what they had been going through that I had no idea about. Um, and on and on and on and on. I mean, Elizabeth Acevedo just won the National Book Award in America for a book called The Poet X. If only I had had that book when I was 14 years old, it would have been a game changer. The Hate You Give, Angie Thomas, Dear, Sto Dear, Dear Martin by Nick Stone, uh, any of Renee Watson's books. I mean, I could go on and on. And we're, we're living in a wonderful time of children's literature. Um, and and uh, none of those books were around when I was, <laughs> when, when I was young. I, I am definitely one of those disciplined writers. I, I travel a lot, and so it can't necessarily be as romantic as people like to make it. You know, it's like, oh, you know, do you get up and you sit in your office, you have your coffee, and you, you know, you have your robe and your corn cob pipe. It's like, no, those days are, are long gone. I, I don't have the luxury of doing that because I'm on the road traveling to schools every day. Uh, so most of my writing is being done on airplanes and in airports, uh, in the backs of cabs, uh, and in hotel rooms far away from my home. Um, but it doesn't matter to me. I don't, I'm not a guy who believes that writing is something, like I don't wait for any muses to come down upon me. I'm not a person who believes in inspiration. I actually think inspiration is a bit amateur. I think, I think we live inspirational, we, we live lives of, of inspiration, right? My life is one where my imagination is fueled by my curiosity. I have an insatiable curiosity and so I live wide open to the world and therefore I need not tap into any inspiration. It lives within me at all times. All I have to do is figure out a moment of space, of time to sit down to actually put my fingers on the keyboard and so I force that by making sure that I don't make excuses for myself because I'm not in the most comfortable setting right we only do this with writers by the way we never ask singers like hey so like do you have like a special singing uh, clothes do you have your singing clothes on do you have your singing room do you have your it's like no I don't need an office to write books like it's not I, need, I just need my tools Right? All I need is my, I need my tools, right? And for all of you out there who are listening who want to be writers, remember every single time you see your hero, right, that, 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 that photograph that you love and idolize and romanticize of your hero sitting at the typewriter with their glasses and their coffee and their pipe, never forget that that was a photo shoot. This is going to feel like a cheap answer, but it is true. You have to read a lot and you have to write a lot. The hardest part about being a writer is actually writing. What happens is you hear nonstop people saying, I'm a writer and I'm working on something, but, the, but they've been working on it for 20 years and they're never getting it done. Writing is about practice. It's literally, it, there's no magic to it, so don't wait for it. There's no magic. It's one word after the next, one sentence after the next, one paragraph after the next, a page after the next, a chapter, that's the way it works. It's just work. It's work, right? And you have to know that it's never going to get easier. I, I just like to be honest about this because I think that people are waiting for there to be this, this abracadabra moment, this aha, where it's like, oh, now the words are flowing out of me. Every single day is a difficult day when you're writing, but that's what makes it special, right? It's like running a marathon, right? The reason people run marathons is because they're hard to do. That's the point of them, right? And writing is no different. So for my advice is number one, don't ask yourself if it's easy or hard. That's an irrelevant question. Ask yourself, are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? Number two, if you are going to do it, sit down and put the words on the page. Number three, don't worry about if the words that come out are perfect. Writer's block often comes from the insecurity of writing badly. Don't be insecure about that because you're going to write badly anyway. Write badly, then go back and fix it. Think of the editing process like cooking chicken breast. This is what I always tell people. You can put chicken breast in a pan with a little bit of heat and it will cook all the way through. It will be complete. But when you taste it, it will taste like nothing. So editing is flavor. You go back, you put a little sauce, you add a little pepper, you put a little salt on there. You do Whatever you have to do, right? Create a marinade for yourself. That's what editing is. It's just adding flavor to that which has already been done, right? It is complete. It is done and edible. It's just boring. Go back and add some flavor to it. Think of editing process that way. And lastly, lastly, just know that when you, that when you write, write a book, think of it like my buddy Sharon Draper used to always tell me, writing a book is like climbing a mountain. 
the highest mountain you've ever climbed. You're not so sure you can do it. I, every time I write a book, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it again. You're not so sure you can do it, but when you get to the top, you say to yourself, I've, I've, I've climbed this mountain, so now I know I can climb a mountain again. But what you'd never, never, ever take into account is that on your way down the mountain, all the footholds change. And so the next time you climb that mountain, it's a new mountain. It's a completely different journey. There's a lot, there's a lot of it. I could go on. There's a lot of advice. Because there's just add, oh, one more piece of advice. Actually, two more short pieces of advice. Number one, have an honest conversation with yourself. And ask yourself, do you want to be a writer or do you want to be famous? Because those things are not the same. Those things are not always the same. And so when I meet people, they're like, y'all want to be a writer. What they're really telling me is they want to be a bestseller. And that's a different thing. If you want to be a writer, be a writer. There's no guarantee of any of the other stuff. But if you take it seriously, and if you're faithful to the process, it will make room for you. And lastly, there's always a fear about what if people don't like what I make? This is always a thing. What if they don't like it? I feel that way, of course, I'm human. Uh, one day I went to see a friend of mine, he owns a restaurant, and I came to him and I said, I'm scared they won't like my book. And he said, let me tell you something. If I offered somebody the perfect steak dinner, he's a chef, if I offered somebody the perfect steak dinner, I'd go to the butcher, I'd cut a perfect piece of meat, I'd come back to the restaurant, I'd season it and marinate it and do all the, I'd create a brine for it, all the things. I'd go to the best garden, I'd pick the best vegetables, I'd come back and I'd roast the vegetables, I'd cook the meat to the perfect temperature, I'd plate it all perfectly, I'd add all the extra accoutrement, the candle, the flowers, the tablecloth, the whole nine. They'd sit down and I'd serve the person and it'd be the perfect kind of serving with the, the cloth over the arm, the whole nine. And if they cut into the steak, and they took a bite and they didn't like it, I would assume it's just because they prefer fish. But not that I didn't cook a perfect steak. And I said, well, how do you know that you cooked the perfect steak? And he said, if it is what you intended it to be, then it is a perfect steak. Don't ever take it personal. Sometimes it's just about what they prefer, not about what you actually made. So writing from a girl's point of view, I, I'd, I'd, you know, it's an interesting question, and I get, I get this question often because it's, it's the only book that is uh, girl-centered. It's not just even her point of view, it's her point of view, and also the entire book is just girls. I mean, she's in an all-girls school, she's got two mothers, she's got uh, the, the track team, she's with all the girls on the track team. It's all, the whole book is basically girls with a sprinkle of ghosts in there, right? Um, and I've written girls in every book, uh, I, actually my, I'm, enjoy writing girls more than anything else. Uh, and so the question is always an interesting question only because th my answer is that it wasn't that hard. It wasn't very difficult. And the reason why it wasn't so difficult is because what I know for certain is that girls are human. And because they're human, we all sort of start at the same space. They want the same things that boys want. They want, they, 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 they want respect, they want space, they want peace, they want to be heard. Patina wants the exact same things that Ghost wants. Nothing is really that different. The details change, right? The, the stakes are a little different only because we live in a world where the stakes have to be different. Um, we live in a space where 12 year old girls uh, have to be 25 in order for them to survive. They have to take on, unfortunately, they have to take on all these extra responsibilities for various reasons uh, that I find completely unfair, but that are woven into our culture. Um, when I was growing up, all the girls in my neighborhood had to go in the house early to make dinner for their little brothers, run bath water, check home homework, pack book bags, and do things that young boys never could do. I can be 15 for the rest of my life if I choose to be, unfortunately, whereas all of my homegirls who were 11 and 12 years old had to be 25, 35, 45 years old, second mothers to their, to their siblings. That was not the case for the boys in my community. And so the only thing that's different are the details of her life, but in terms of who she is intrinsically, everything is exactly the same. Right? And I think that's the one thing we have to remember. If you want to write women, write them as human, and you're 75% and you're of the way there.